Hey YouTube, so there's a classic argument for uh, pessimism about the prospects of philosophy, which appeals to the fact of widespread disagreement within philosophy. Uh, so philosophers never seem to reach any convergence on at least the big questions. So when you consider a question like, you know, what is causality? What is knowledge? Does God exist? Are there objective moral values? Um, if we look at the history of philosophy, well, it seems like philosophers just go round and round in circles, uh, you know, we're debating, broadly speaking, the same sorts of things that we were debating 2000 years ago. And, you know, we just never really seem to uh, exhibit much progress uh, in the sense of converging on theories that we can all accept. And, you know, a lot of people look at this and think that, okay, this, this seems like a problem, right? Uh, certainly, it seems like, uh, there's some sense in which, say, the sciences exhibit progress, uh, but philosophy does not. And so you know, this is kind of the disagreement argument against philosophy. Um, but there's another argument in the same vicinity here, which I don't see discussed so much. So notice that disagreement in philosophy extends to claims about what it is that other philosophers actually believe. Uh, like, so the disagreement is we don't just disagree about, you know, what the facts are, we disagree about what we're each saying. Um, so if I ask, for instance, well, what exactly was Hume's position about whatever? Like, what, what, was, what was Hume doing? What was his position? Well, it turns out there's a whole bunch of different interpretations of Hume. Um, you know, broadly speaking, we can say there's like the, the naturalist interpretation and the skeptic interpretation. Um, and then with respect to more specific things like, okay, what was Hume's view of causality? Was he an anti-realist about causality? Was he a kind of realist about causality? Uh, and what kind, like, if he was an anti-realist, what kind of anti-realist was he, etc. Um, I mean, there's people who've adopted all sorts of positions on what it is that Hume was saying. And I mean, these disagreements are quite significant, right? So it makes a difference to the, uh, to the power and to the point of Hume's argument, whether we interpret him as a philosophical naturalist or a philosophical skeptic, right? That makes a big difference. Um, and of course, it's not just Hume, right? Problems of interpretation arise for every philosopher, um, including living ones who are able to clarify their own positions. I mean, a, actually, a, a, a pretty large portion of what philosophers do when they're defending their position is they spend their time trying to clarify misinterpretations that they've identified other people as making. So, you know, we sort of say, hey, look, um, actually, your argument misses the point. Um, and so, you know, even living philosophers have trouble communicating to each other what it is that they actually believe. Philosophers routinely misunderstand each other and accuse others of misunderstanding them. Um, it is, so it's, it's difficult to communicate even um, what might seem like straightforward positions. Um, and I mean, this, this problem is, is it, it arises um, for those areas of philosophy, like even those areas of philosophy that are one's own area of like expertise. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, for instance, I think uh, that both the logical positivists, for instance, and, and Karl Popper um, are kind of straw man. In fact, I think quite clearly straw man in even in the introductions to philosophy of science that are written by professional philosophers of science. I did a video on Karl Popper, for instance, Popper's falsificationism. And, you know, if I was to do that video today, I would do it quite differently because I think that I kind of just mangled what Popper was saying. Um, but I mean, I don't know how much to blame myself for that because I was just presenting the way it had been taught to me. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, anybody who objects to the video that I made on Karl Popper, well, like, go and read Peter Godfrey Smith's Theory and Reality, you know, I mean, he kind of makes the same errors. Um, so, so, okay, like, even within, you know, the areas that we know well, there are serious misunderstandings of what other philosophers are saying. It seems like in order to, in order to, to be confident that I actually understand a philosopher, I would at the very least need to, like, devote 
myself to studying that philosopher. It's not good enough to just say, well, you know, yeah, I did a course on philosophy of science. Um, you know, we talked about Popper and falsificationism. So now I've got a good handle on what Popper was saying. Like, no, I'd have to go away and really, you know, research Popper. I'd have to spend m weeks, months, however long, like devoting myself to to reading Popper specifically. Um, and of course, we just, nobody has time to do that for anything beyond a relatively small number of philosophers. I mean, we, we just don't, right? Uh, no, nobody does that. Um, I mean, again, obviously there are philosophers that you end up sort of falling in love with, and so you spend your time reading them, and what, and you'll become quite frustrated when you do that, because you then can see all of the ways in which other people have completely misunderstood them. And of course, as you spend more and more time reading them, you then maybe start to think that you yourself misunderstood them in the past, etc. Um, so, I mean, there's a kind of pessimistic induction here, right? Where it's like, okay, many times in the past, I've, I have misunderstood the positions of other people. So it's like, um, you know, when in the past I have spent time, um, spent sort of more time than usual right, reading a given philosopher, I will see that I misunderstood that philosopher, and indeed that most other people misunderstand that philosopher in significant ways, right? These aren't just like minor points of interpretation. Some of them are quite significant ways. So I probably misunderstand most of the philosophers I read today, right? I probably don't know what most of the philosophers I read and most of the philosophers I talk about and think about and that I try to respond to. I probably don't know, I don't really know what they're talking about. Um, you know, so I say that, uh, that Quine claimed that P, you say he claimed that Q, where Q entails not P, whatever. I might be, I might be wrong about Quine, um, of course, uh, or you might be wrong about Quine, whatever. Um, and of course, the thing is, is that notice that, 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 that now we have this same problem of potential misunderstanding at a, at a higher level, right? So I say that Quine claimed that P, you say that Quine claimed that Q, and we're thinking, okay, th this is diff like, okay, Q entails not P. Um, so we have two different interpretations of Quine. But just as I probably misunderstand Quine, I also probably misunderstand your interpretation of Quine. Um, there will be multiple ways of interpreting your interpretation of Quine. So, uh, so I don't really, so actually I'm not so sure that you misunderstand Quine, right? I can't be so sure that you misunderstand Quine because for the, for whatever reason I have for thinking that I've misunderstood Quine, I should also think that I've misunderstood your interpretation of Quine. Um, so, I mean, maybe we don't misunderstand each other, but that's just because, like, we, well, yeah, I mean, we kind of do, or, uh, we, we just can't say, right? We end up in this thoroughly sceptical position where, it, where sort of any philosophical claim, including claims about what other people are saying, ends up being misunderstood. Um, so, okay, here's, uh, here's the sort of pessimistic conclusion, is that um, I, I should have relatively low confidence that I understand what other philosophers are saying. And I mean, I think that this, and there's other ways to kind of drive at this, at this conclusion as well. I mean, notice that um, very often in philosophy, the argument is made that what seem like substantive disputes are actually merely verbal disputes. So when it comes to, for instance, debates on free will, I can kind of see the plausibility of the view that actually... Uh, there's not there's not really a, a, a dispute about like what the facts are. This is just a dispute about semantics, about how we're using words. I mean, I'm not saying that that is my position, but I can see the plausibility of it. And this is something that people say about a lot of philosophical debates. So similarly, when it comes to, um, you know, mirrology, debates between uh, mirrological nihilists and mirrological universalists, right? The nihilists say that there are no composite objects. There are only... Uh, you know, simple, so there are no chairs, there are only particles arranged chair-wise. Um, the mirrorological universalist says that everything, it, like, like it, any, everything composes further objects. So, you know, uh, if you have any two objects at all, they compose a further object. Um, it's often suggested that this, that the debate between these positions is merely verbal. They're just different ways of using words. Um, so it's not really substantive. And so... You know, the, so the thought is, is okay, there's, there's all of these philosophical debates where initially it seems like we actually have a disagreement, 
but then it turns out that what seemed like a disagreement is just different ways of using words, so we don't really disagree. Um, and then maybe the things that I think now are genuine disagreements uh, are not really disagreements uh, at all. We're just, you know, using words in slightly different ways, but I kind of haven't picked up on that because I, you know, misunderstand you. So if it's the case that there is just widespread misunderstanding, this would explain why, you know, there's so many seeming verbal disagreements in philosophy or why we kind of don't even know how much verbal disagreement there is, why it's so hard for us to establish, um, you know, when something is a substantive debate versus when it's merely verbal. Um, or similarly, consider how many philosophers tend to accuse others of uh, meaninglessness, right? Um, I mean, I think that this is sort of not... You don't see these sorts of arguments so often now, um, but certainly in the history of philosophy, uh, I, I think, you know, there's been plenty of examples of this. The logical positivists, of course, are the most famous ones, right? You know, the verification criterion, uh, anything that's... Any statement that's meaningful must be either analytic or empirically verifiable, and so we can dispose with a lot of metaphysics as just being meaningless. And of course, they didn't just say this. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can find that at least some of the positivists would actually analyze meta some of these metaphysical statements in detail and try to show that they are meaningless. Um, or, you know, pragmatist approaches, right? You know, these might be framed in terms of meaning as well, right? Maybe in order for a statement to be meaningful, it must be like, applicable in inquiry in some way or something like that. Ordinary language philosophers, um, you know, they try to show that like apparent what seem like genuine philosophical problems are actually just arising from a misuse of language and we're not really expressing anything meaningful. Um, analytic philosophers in general, uh, you know, are suspicious of the meaningfulness of much continental philosophy. Um, and so philosophers uh, often accuse each other of just saying things that are unintelligible or meaningless and that's exactly what we would expect if in fact as this as the pessimistic view would be if in fact we just don't understand each other right um there's just you know we just have no idea what what each of it, what we're each saying uh, <laughs> um so yeah this is the this is the pessimistic um pessimistic argument right like there's there's reason to, to have relatively low confidence whenever you're reading a philosopher that you actually understand what that philosopher is saying, even when you have received, you know, what you might think are kind of, what you might think is a good kind of basis uh, for understanding them. Like even when you've been taught uh, in the context of like a university, you've been to lectures, you've read the material and so on, even once you have all of that, um, you should have low confidence that you actually understand the philosopher. Um, and notice actually that this, if this argument goes through, then it blocks some of the usual responses to um, pessimistic views of philosophy. So with respect to the standard argument from disagreement, uh, I, I actually don't think the argument from disagreement leads to a, a, a particularly pessimistic conclusion. Um, so, okay, let's just grant that philosophers um, go round and round in circles and they never achieve convergence on any theories. Well, we might say, well, look, you know, the point of philosophy isn't really to get at the truth. Um, the point of philosophy is to explore the options, you know, it's to like explore conceptual space. It's to like lay out the different positions and figure out what's entailed by those positions. And then, you know, we kind of map out the various, various views and then we present the best possible arguments for those views. So, you know, we're not, we're not really trying to get at the truth. We're just, you know, we're trying to present good arguments and, you know, present a sort of conceptual map of what the options are. Um, but if, the argument from misunderstanding is right, then it looks like philosophy isn't actually very good at that either. Uh, so it's not just that philosophers fail to converge on the truth. Um, it's that philosophers, they don't, they don't even map things out very well. Like, because, okay, maybe I, I can create like a kind of nice little map in my own head uh, of what the options are, but um, all of the other philosophers have got completely different maps. And so, you know, there's no, it's, it's not like I can be confident that, um, that we're even converging on 
getting the same map. Um, there's no... I, 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 okay, I, I just have what, like a list of positions in my head, but I don't even understand. I can, I should think, well, actually, I don't really even understand those positions myself or how my position differs from these positions. So if the argument from misunderstanding is right, then, um, you know, at least some of the things that philosophy might be doing other than getting at the truth, it turns out it's not very good at those things either. Um, so I think that, um, you know, there, so yeah, there we go. That was uh, pretty much uh, what I wanted to say about that. Just uh, putting another pessimistic argument on the table. Maybe it's the case that nobody really understands anybody else in philosophy. And uh, anyway, I'll wrap it up there. And I look forward to reading your comments in which I'm quite sure that none of you will get the point of this video. Um, so that will be fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs>